Praise the Lord, saints. Welcome back to another Sunday school lesson. Uh, to God be the glory for the great things that he has done and the things that he is doing. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the audio and video crew who make this possible. Uh, God bless you. Without you, we couldn't do this without you. Amen. I wanted to get that out of the way. And I wanted to say welcome back to another Sunday school lesson. Uh, of course, this Sunday school lesson, the topic is Victorious Love in one of my Sunday school books. And in the other one, it's Haunted by Shame. Uh, love was victorious in this, uh, this story. Uh, we're still dealing with the, uh, the life of Joseph. Uh, the life of Joseph, uh, of course, Jacob was his father and he had 11 brothers. And uh, this story is filled with uh, a lot of uh, regrets, a lot of uh, shameful things, hurtful things, uh, a lot of bitterness and anger, uh, uh, favoritism and jealousy and envy. Uh, it has all the uh, proper ingredients for a, 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 a drama movie, or a drama show. But nevertheless, it is the life of Joseph. It just reminds me of Romans 8 and 28 that God can work all things out for the good of those that love the Lord. Our lesson this week is coming from uh, Genesis 42, verses 6 through 25. Once again, this month, a uh, month of September, the topic is struggles with love. We're talking about mankind struggling with love, not God, because God is love. And so God cannot struggle with love. I want to open up with a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, we come before you in the most humblest and the most sincerest way that I know how, praying, Lord God, that you would hide me behind Calvary's cross, Lord God, that I would uh, decrease so that you may increase. Lord, I pray that you would stand up in me, Lord God, that you would show yourself mighty, show yourself strong. Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone under the sound of my voice, bless greater St. John, my greater St. John family, bless our, our pastor. Uh, Pastor Brown, Lord, I pray that you continue to watch over each and every one of us and bless each and every one of us. I pray that you would comfort those that are bereaved. Lord God, I pray that you would heal those that are sick. Lord, I pray that you just would restore those that have fallen away. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless us and make us a blessing. Lord, I pray that you would show yourself mighty, show yourself strong in each and every one of us that others may see Jesus in us. Lord, I give you all of the honor and all the glory and all the praise. Lord, I pray that something will be said and done that will cause someone to be wiser, cause them to be better, to cause them to be stronger. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. As I said, this lesson came from Genesis 42, verses 6 through 25. I want to set a little bit of the background, if 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 you, if I might. Uh the unifying topic is love versus guilt. The lesson text would be divided into three sections. The famine, which is Genesis 42, verses 6 through 12. I need proof is the second one, and it is from Genesis 42, 13 through 20. And the third one is the penalty is due, Genesis 42, verses 21 through 25. And our main thought is, and Reuben answered them saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. That came from Genesis 42, verses, verse 22. The unifying principle goes like this. Some people allow guilt from their past to poison their present. Is it ever possible to be free from condemnation for past actions? When Joseph saw and remembered his brothers who sold him into Egyptian slavery, he showed compassion while motivating them to recall and take responsibility for their earlier actions. Our lesson aim is to demonstrate through the life of Joseph and his encounters with his brothers that godly sorrow leads to repentance. Amen. We can forgive those who have wronged us by how? How? By walking in love. And the lesson aim is to forgive those who have wronged us and to understand that even in situations where intentions were evil and caused us harm, God will work all together for our 
good. Amen. Amen. That's a fact. I'm a living witness. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. The commentator begins by laying the foundation. He says, at times we may have to take drastic measures to resolve an issue. In today's lessons, Jacob could not sit back and watch his family die of starvation. He heard that there was grain in Egypt, so he urged his 10 sons to go there to buy grain. Little did he know that his own son, Joseph, was the man in charge of all the grain in Egypt. Quite often, when disaster strikes, many are so traumatized by the situations that they fail to act. Others will forge ahead without seeking God's direction in the situation, such as those who stockpile supplies and food at the outbreak of COVID-19 in the United States. When tempted to do wrong to solve our problems, we should stop, count to 10, and ask God, to show you the right way to handle the situation. The introduction. When Joseph was a young man, his brothers wanted to kill him. Instead, they threw him in a pit and then sold him to traveling merchants. The merchants then sold him into slavery. Little did they know God would raise him from the pit and put him in the palace. Pharaoh was a wise man, and he took note that Joseph was a man who was full of the Spirit of God. Joseph was 30 years old when Pharaoh made him prime minister over all of Egypt. Joseph had an outstanding character, ability, and wisdom from God. He was therefore qualified to administer the affairs of the nation of Egypt. God orchestrated the events in Joseph's life so he was sufficiently prepared through trials, hardships, and suffering to take on the leadership role of prime minister. Let's read the scriptures and go right into the lesson. But expound on the scriptures. And Joseph was the governor over the land. And he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dream which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men, thy servants, and no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, That is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby shall ye be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Said one of you, send one of you and let him fetch your brother and ye shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved whether there be any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into war three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, this do and live for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound into the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for your famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. Verse 21 through 25, And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul, when he besought us. 
and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered and saying, Spake I not unto you? saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them and wept, and returned to them again, and communed with them, and took from them Simon, and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus he did unto them. Amen. Here, Joseph has been in slavery for 13 years. Joseph hadn't prepared himself to, for this occasion. He did nothing to prepare himself for, he thought he would never see his brothers again or his family. Uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, they were just uh, a, a part of his life in the past. But now, 13 years later, unexpectedly, his brother shows up. One thing about this story is Joseph, the title is Victorious Love. Joseph was victorious because of the love that God had, uh, the love of God was in him. If you don't have God's love in you, you can't forgive others. Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, if my brother sins against me, how many times shall I forgive him? Seven times seven? Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. In other words, you continue to forgive him. Amen. Verse 6 starts out by saying that Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold all the grain to the people. His task for preparing for the famine was complete. Now the task of distributing aid was his primary responsibility. Joseph was the man. If you wanted anything to eat, any food, you had to go through Joseph. You couldn't go around him. You couldn't get beside him. You couldn't go over top of him. You couldn't go up under him. You had to go through Joseph to get any kind of food out of Egypt because there was no food nowhere else. Joseph had prepared for this distribution of aid, and that was his primary responsibility. So, and so on in verse 6, it says that when Joseph's brothers came, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Showing respect for a foreign dignitary, the brothers were bowed down appropriately to Joseph. This almost fulfills Joseph's dream of some two decades earlier, recorded in Genesis 37. I say almost because only 10 of the 11 stars, the brothers, were bowing down at this point. Amen. Only 10 of the brothers bowed down. Benjamin wasn't there. Verse 7 and 8 says, And soon, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them and asked the question, Where did you come from? They replied, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. Joseph recognized his brothers immediate. Almost 20 years had passed before Joseph's brothers came. 13 years was in slavery, and another seven years, Joseph had served uh, the seven years of uh, plenty. Now it was seven years of famine, amen, which totals to 20 years since the last time he saw his brothers. You can only imagine Joseph's face at, at this surprise encounter. He probably thought he'd never see them again. He probably wondered how they were doing, what they were doing, how they turned out to be. He probably wondered how would they treat him if, if, if they met again? What would they say? A lot was going through Joseph's mind uh, when he saw his brothers and recognized them. But what, what, what I like about it is the recognition is not a two-way street. He recognized them, 
but they didn't recognize him. How can you do something like they did to his brother and not recognize him when you see him again? Maybe it was because Joseph was uh, dressed like an Egyptian. He probably had his, uh, uh, his, his hair or his beard uh, trimmed closely like an Egyptian. He spoke like an Egyptian. He had mannerisms like an Egyptian. They couldn't phantom seeing uh, Joseph in any other way other than being a Hebrew, let alone in the position of governor of Egypt. Joseph had probably wondered a many day what he would say if he saw his brothers again. Verse 9 says, Then he remembered his dream about them. Seeing, Joseph, seeing his brothers bow down to him brought back Joseph's memory of his dream of authority in his family. Amen. God gave him that dream, but he didn't tell him what all he was going to have to go through for this dream to come to pass. He surely must have remembered how much his brothers despised him on account of his dreams. His brothers said that the Bible said that they could not even speak peaceably to him. They hated him just that much. Amen. They couldn't even speak peaceably to him. The commentator writes, ironically, their actions to prevent any uh, extent to power on Joseph's part, it did just the opposite. What they meant for evil, God turned it around. Human nature suggests that there may have been some sense of satisfaction on Joseph's part when he remembered his dream and his brothers bowed down to him. I can imagine so. He felt some sense of satisfaction. It came to pass. Probably those four words came to his mind. It came to pass. Verse 9 says, uh, B says, And said to them, Ye are spies. Ye have come to see where the land is unprotected. Or he says, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land are ye come. Now Joseph wants to test his brothers. Joseph used the line of interrogation we see here to test his brother's character. Have they improved in it in the two decades since selling him into slavery? He wanted to know if they had changed. The years of famine came just as Joseph predicted. Jacob and his family was running out of food. He sent his sons, all except Benjamin, to travel to Canaan to buy food. Twenty years had passed. When the brothers arrived, they didn't recognize him. He acknowledged he had changed over the course of 20 years. He needed to know if they had done the same thing. He became wise through his experiences. As I said last week, some of your experiences are, are not very pleasant experiences, but don't let your unpleasant experiences cause you to be bitter. L allow them to cause you to be better. Allow them to cause you to be wiser. Joseph grew wiser because of his bad experiences. Joseph's true motivation seemed to have been more noble than that. The longer he could hide his identity behind a mask of harshness, the more likely it was that he would elicit truthful statements from his brothers. One thing I've learned, a person can only fake something for so long before the true person really comes out. Amen. Joseph noticed, the first thing Joseph noticed was that his brother Benjamin was not with them. He noticed that they was telling the truth. Joseph noticed that Benjamin, his brother, and the others of, of sons of their mother, Rachel, was absent from the group. He must have wondered if Benjamin was dead. Because they hated him so much, he wondered if they hated his brother. And what about their father, Jacob? Is it possible that Jacob... Is it possible that Joseph desired to find out more about his brothers? Joseph prolonged them, antagonized them. He did, did they despise him after all these years? Had they repented of their treatment? He wanted to know if they were sorry. Verse 10, after he accused them of being spies, they said to him, No, no, they answered, your servants have come to buy food. His accusation seemed to have been intended to put his brothers on the defense. That's what he, that's the desire that he uh, affected, he achieved. They go on to say, we are all the sons of one man, your servants. We are honest men. 
No, no. He says, we are all the servants of one. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, ye have come to see where the land is unprotected. He says, Joseph continues in accusation mode. People under stress may make unguarded comments. Joseph was stressing them out, accusing them to see if under stress. One thing I found out, if you tell the truth, you can tell the same story every time. But if you tell a lie, you have to tell another lie to cover that lie up. So Joseph keeps on accusing them to see if they're going to change their story. But they didn't slip up. He was looking for a slip up, but they didn't. You have to tell the same story. When you tell the truth, you will tell the same story. Verse 13 said, But they replied, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. In their hasty denials, the brothers reveal several pieces of information that Joseph could immediately verify as true. Joseph knew that they were true. Both his father, Jacob, and his youngest brother, Benjamin, were still alive. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you. No, you are spies. Still, Joseph challenged the men's truthfulness. And I can understand why Joseph challenged their truthfulness. Because they had lied to their father about Joseph by saying that the, the animals had eaten him up and, and they smeared his coat with uh, uh, goat's blood to uh, make it look like he had been eaten by animals. They lied to their father about him. Why wouldn't they still tell a lie? So Joseph is challenging them to see if the men's truthful with, with, with accusations of spine. Verse 15 says, let me see, verse 15 says, hereby ye shall be proved by the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved whether ye be, uh, whether there be any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely Ye are spies. Joseph gave the men what seemed to them to be a chance to prove that they were who they claimed. But Joseph already knew they were telling the truth. He was just pretending to be, uh, to be a thoroughly Egyptian. He was, just th he was just pretending to be a thoroughly Egyptian continued. He put them in custody for three days. With the, why this three-day timeout? It may have been a tactic for Joseph to, uh, to come up with an alternative that he needed time to consider how to convince his brothers it was necessary to bring Benjamin to him. Joseph was concerned about his younger brother. He wanted to know if his youngest brother was still alive. He wanted to know if they had been mistreating his younger brother. There were some questions that Joseph wanted to know. He missed out on his family life, and he wanted some answers to the questions. <clears throat> Verse 18 says, And Joseph said unto them on the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. On the third day, apparently, after more thought, Joseph was ready to dictate a different set of conditions. Before revealing his new plan, however, Joseph gave the rationale for his decision, his fear of God. He changed his mind because of his fear of God. Joseph clearly referred to his fear of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Such a statement might have tipped his brothers off that something was different about this Egyptian governor. Now, why would the Egyptian governor make this statement? <clears throat> it could cause the brothers to think that Joseph feared some God, but which one remained a mystery. To further complicate things, Joseph looked like an Egyptian, he had an Egyptian name, Zaphonath Paniah, and was married to the daughter of a priest of Ra, to the daughter of the priest of Ra. 
Joseph's brothers probably assumed Zepheth Paniah worshipped Ra and other Egyptian gods when he made the statement, for I fear God. They still didn't recognize him, not even by him making that statement. They didn't recognize his look or his, his, his voice or his speech. Verse 19 says, if ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye carry corn for the famine of your houses. houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. Only one brother, rather than nine, was required to stay in Egypt as a ransom. The others would take grain at Joseph's orders back to Canaan. Joseph had a plan. Joseph did not tell them when to come back, only that they must bring the youngest brother with them. Judging from Joseph's words, the punishment for espionage was death. So they proceeded to do so. Verse 21 says, And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore it is this distress come upon us. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. So intense was their hatred and contempt that Joseph's cries for mercy went willfully unheard. Yet those cries echoed back to them in, at this moment, confirming their guilt and that their punishment was at hand for the crime. At least it's what they believed. It's striking that these 10 men were blaming themselves for the death of the man who was standing before them. Guilt will beat you down. Guilt will beat you down. The Bible says in the book of Romans, therefore there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Uh, God doesn't condemn us. God says uh, in John 3, 17, I didn't come to condemn you. Amen. I came to save you. Amen. So God does not condemn us. God has never once reminded me of my past. Who reminds me of my past? Other people. I, I used to be this, I used to do this, I used to hang this, I used to drink this. That's what people say, but God never condemns you. Guilt will beat you down. Amen. It will drive you insane. And Reuben answered and said, saying, Spake I not unto you, do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. They figured this is why this is come upon them. This is what they said. The, beloved, the brothers believe that when one, enters in, when one encounters distress or troubles, it was a punishment. You can look at the life of Job. Job's friends thought that he had did something wrong, thought that he had sinned. That's why he was going through. We may still feel that our struggles are God's judgment on us for our past sins. Not so. But like the brothers, we only see, we only see part of the story and should be weary of interpreting too confidently of God's intention. Ironically, this trouble has visited them because of Joseph, not as punishment, but because God has worked through their sins to save them. Amen. God used them to put Joseph through these trials and tribulations, but it was for their good. It was to save them, but they didn't see that. Reuben replied, Jacob's firstborn, uh, uh, that jo Joseph knew nothing of what Reuben had said in his defense. Reuben's statement about, an, uh, about accounting for Joseph's blood confirmed that he believed Joseph had died and that he considered all of his brothers present to be guilty of his death. Uh, what I like about this is verse 23, and they, and they knew not that Joseph understood. Joseph, during this encounter, Joseph used an interpreter. He was speaking uh, Egyptian and they were speaking Hebrew. So they thought he didn't understand uh, Hebrew when Reuben made that statement. Joseph turned his back and cried. He wept and returned to them. And he commanded that they fill their sack with corn to restore every man's money uh, to, uh, to their sack and to give them the provisions so that they could be on their way. As I said, this is an interesting uh, story about Joseph. And uh, it reminds me that uh, 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 you can't hold grudges. 
the Bible says, uh, be angry, but sin not. Uh, the Bible also says, let not the sun go down on, on your wrath. Uh, so you have to uh, learn to forgive. And uh, you're forgiving them for yourself, not, not for, um, for yourself, not for them, but for yourself. Amen. I hope you got something out of this lesson. I really enjoyed this lesson. Uh, it is an awesome story. It's a dynamic story about the life of Joseph. Uh, our topic next week will be Love Prevails Over All, which will be our, my final lesson. It will be taken from Genesis 43 verses, 43 verses, no, 43 and verse 45, 1 through 15. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the visitation of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the, the, your written word, Lord God, your holy word, Lord God, that will lead us and guide us in all truths. Lord, we bless your name, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you would watch over us while we're between, while we're apart from one another. Bring us back at the appointed time, and we'll be mindful to give you all of the honor, all of the glory, and all of the praise. And it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen.